Father's love, everyone, and welcome. This week we conclude our Christmas series with part four entitled The End of the Religion by Bruxy Cavi. So as always, kick back and relax. And let's see what the Holy Spirit has to teach us this week. Today we focus on a mysterious New Testament teaching, union with Christ. Jesus taught that union with himself, Christ in us, and we in Christ, is the basis of our salvation, and it all begins with the Incarnation. The basis of our union with Christ is Christ's union with us, in the Incarnation. We can become one with him because he first became one with us. If Christ were not truly and fully man, we could not be saved, for only a second Adam could undo the damage caused by the first. The mystery of Christ is that in him heaven and earth have been joined together. God and man, creator and creature, have been united, the infinite and the finite, the immaterial and the material, the invisible and the visible, have become one. This is the purpose of the gospel, that Christ should become ours and that we should be engrafted into his body. We conclude that a Christian lives not in himself, but in Christ and his neighbor. Otherwise, he is not a Christian. He lives in Christ through faith in his neighbor through love. Thou hast raised our human nature on the clouds to God's right hand. There there we sit in heavenly places. There with thee in glory stand. Jesus reigns, adored by angels. Man with God is on the throne. Mighty Lord, in thine ascension, we by faith behold our own. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you, Jesus. Welcome, everyone, across all of our Meeting House sites. I'm so glad that you are with us for the conclusion of our series, Incarnation, the Gospel in a Manger. We have been talking about how the crib, as well as the cross, is a symbol of our faith. It is at the centerpiece of the Gospel, that God became one of us, not just that Jesus came and died on the cross, but it's who it was who died on the cross and rose again. It is God in the flesh. And we've been talking about this as having tremendous implications for us in the here and now. In fact, today's message is one that I've been waiting a long time to be able to share. I'm very excited about it. Um, and for, for some of us, it'll help turn on some, uh, some, you know, switch on a light for our thinking and for our understanding and for our identity. We've been talking about the gospel, the good news message of Jesus, and we've been saying that you could summarize it in one word, and that is Jesus. It is who Jesus is and the whole story of Jesus. We can expand that to the gospel in three words, which is Jesus is Lord. And then we talked about the gospel in 30 words, just giving us a larger view of the multidimensional nature of the good news message of Jesus, and we phrased it this way. The gospel is the good news of God's kingdom come. God has come to us through Christ to show his love, save from sin, share his peace, and shut down religion. And we've worked our way through all four of these, and here we are on the last one to shut down religion. We're going to talk about the implications of the good news message of Jesus being severely irreligious in their implications. The way of religion and the way of grace are distinctly different. So that's what we're talking about over the next few minutes, and you can open up your 
your Bibles to John's Gospel, John chapter 14. And if you're a new or you, have, you don't have a Bible with you, we have visitor Bibles across all of our sites. At regional sites, they're usually down and to either side. And in Oakville, they're towards the back. This is a fine time for you to get up and go and grab a Bible or find someone close to you you can share with and look up John's Gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament. And we're going to be in John 14, 15, 16, and 17. We're headed there eventually, but before we get there, there's a, a number of verses I wanna share with you from scripture so that you can see there is this theme in New Covenant teaching that is summarized by a phrase that gets used in Christian theology, and that's, here's the phrase, union with Christ. Union with Christ. It's w one of the hallmark doctrines or teachings of the Christian faith that's really rooted in many, many passages of scripture. It comes up again and again and again. Both Christ in us and us in Christ. It speaks of this amazing intimacy that we have. And then if Christ is in God and we're in Christ, what are the implications for us and in the intimacy that we have with the Almighty? So uh, we're going to take a quick view of a bunch of scriptures and then we're gonna pack it all together and say, what does this mean for us? Let me talk to you a little bit about this doctrine of union with Christ. The Apostle Paul says some interesting things. For instance, in Ephesians chapter five, he's talking about marriage and the relationship of a husband and wife. And then he mentions Jesus and says, for we are members of his body. Then he goes back to talking about marriage again. He says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The two will become one flesh. And then he says, this is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. He flows in and out of this conversation about marriage and the intimacy of Jesus with us. And, he's, and ultimately he says, I'm really focusing on the relationship between Jesus and us. And even when he sees passages about marriage, the two becoming one flesh, he says in that, yes, it applies to marriage, but in that ultimately this is a statement about the profound mystery of intimacy with Jesus and his people. He goes on to say things like this in 1 Corinthians 6, 15, where some of the guys in, in the church in Corinth we're taking this message of grace, that you're saved by grace, not by works, and saying, that's a great message. I, that means I get to live however I want. So the first thing they did is start going and visiting prostitutes. So Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, therefore, where's a prostitute? That's what it came down to for them. It was like, oh, grace, I love the message of grace. So Paul has to write them and say, wait a second, if you really love Jesus, if you really, don't you see that you want to be closer to the one you love, not use that as an excuse to walk away from? And it's interesting what he says in having this discussion with them. He doesn't say, how dare you, uh, how dare you use a prostitute like this because if you do, you will be severely judged. Or I, uh, how dare you insult God who, how dare, he doesn't, he doesn't crack down on the threat of punishment. He tries to reorient their thinking about who they are. Think about who you are differently and your decisions will flow out of that. So this is a line he says in the middle of that conversation about whether or not Christian men should visit prostitutes. He, uh, he says, uh, duh, no. And then he says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Isn't that interesting? He doesn't say, do you not know that your bodies are members of the church, but are members of Christ himself, so that when you go and you engage in things you ought not engage in, it's like you're bringing Jesus with you. You're bringing the body of Christ with you. When you lie, when you cheat, when you steal, when you insult, you are bringing Jesus into that moment of relational friction, relational judgment, and Jesus doesn't want to be dragged into those scenarios, but you are the body of Christ. This is how Jesus is physically living out his life in the world right now. This is just true, says Paul. You can't escape that. Now let that awareness affect how you live and the decisions that you make. He goes on in 1 Corinthians to say in chapter 12, well, wait, wait, before we go there, let me ask you to complete the sentence and then we'll say what the Apostle Paul actually says. How would you complete this sentence? Um, just as in a body, there are many parts, each part doing something different, yet being united in one body, so it is with the, 
I would say so it is with the church. Uh, That's what I would think, because that's the analogy I think he'd be going for. Just like there are many parts, all different, but coming together, one body, so it is with the church. It's not actually what Paul says, and it's surprising, but we read it so often, I think we don't see how shocking it is. He says, just as there, he's having a conversation about the church, but he says, just as in a body, the one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. It's actually, this is, I'm talking about Christ himself now, living his life out through the church. If you know this passage, 1 Corinthians 12, you know that it's a passage that is all about the church and how we are all differently gifted and we all work together. And he says, that is Christ. That's how it is with Christ. Christ, living his life out in the church. Uh, Sometimes it's about Jesus in us, sometimes it's about us in Christ. First of all, let's look at a few passages about Christ in us. He says in Colossians, Paul says, Colossians 1, he talks about the great mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. In Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. In Galatians 4, 19, he says, my dear children, for whom I'm again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. When you come to faith, Jesus is implanted inside, he says, but now we work together. I labor with you to help Jesus take shape inside your life. Every moment of choice is this existential opportunity of definition of our existence. Every time we have an opportunity to make a choice, will I frown or will I smile? Will I greet kindly or will I ignore? Will I initiate love or will I say I'm too busy? Will I, all these, every moment of choice is this moment where we, we are partnering with what Jesus wants to do and he is, he is forming fully in us or we are suppressing Jesus, we are ignoring and moving in a different direction. And Paul says, we cooperate together. I'm laboring with you to help, to help Christ form in you. And at first reading, all of this stuff can just sound like poetry. It's just like a poetic way of saying, but there's no hint of, at any point, Paul saying, I don't mean really. It actually, as these verses begin to heap upon each other, realize he really is talking like this is, true, not just a poetic picture. Uh, That's Christ in us. Look at at how that happens. Romans 8 is a passage where uh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are all talked about interchangeably as indwelling us. Christ is in us, but he's in us through the Holy Spirit because sometimes the Bible talks about Jesus being in heaven. I mean, that's the ascension after his resurrection, the ascension, then he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, but yet Christ is in us. How does that happen? It happens through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actually brings the person, the mind, the character of Christ into us. And so look, look at the interchangeability of Jesus and, and God and Spirit and, and how Paul just freely moves from one to the other. He says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, and just Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, that's always attributed to God the Father in scripture. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. Then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So the spirit, some of you might remember when we did our series called We Believe, which was all about what we believe. What a creative title that series had. That, that series, We Believe, uh, which walked through just basic doctrines or theology of, uh, of Christians and, and, uh, and us as Anabaptists, some of our Anabaptist distinctives as well, we talked about the Christian doctrine of perichoresis. Perichoresis means the, the interpenetrable nature of the Trinity, that the union of the Trinity, although there, there are distinct personages in relationship, they represent one another so intimate, they, 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 they penetrate one another. Where one ends off and the other starts is not so clearly delineated. Jesus says, when he gives the Great Commission, he ends it by saying, and I will be with you always. And then he leaves. 
but he sends the Spirit, and then through the Spirit talks about Christ being in us so that we have this even greater intimacy than the original 12 disciples were able to experience with Jesus through the power of the Spirit. So, so with, with Jesus, with the Spirit in us, we also commune with the Son and the Father. That's, that's Christ in us, and that's amazing. But now, the passages that talk about us in Christ are somehow even more uh, mind-blowing to me. The more I stare into this, it is amazing. So we in Christ, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. We often focus on the new creation in this verse, but it all starts with being in Christ. In Ephesians 1, we read, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. That Holy Spirit comes to us when we believe the gospel, and when that happens, we're included in Christ. And the only thing preventing that from happening to anyone is if we don't believe. God can offer his whole heart to us complete intimacy to us. If I don't believe that, I walk away from instead of toward. I turn my back on, I live as though. So the only thing preventing you from fully experiencing this is if you don't believe it. Once your heart shifts and you say, I believe this, everything changes. That's, that's all God is calling us to do is simply to receive this gift, to believe enough, to trust that it's true. And when we trust that it's true, then we experience the full intimacy that we are called to. In Ephesians chapter two, Paul writes, and God raised us up with Christ. Oh, so if we are in Christ, then what happened to Christ and what is happening to Christ also counts for us as well. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Well, well that's interesting. So. You know that paradox, we're saying, well, Jesus is in heaven, but he's also here on earth with us. The paradox is also true for us. We're on earth, but we're also in heaven, in Christ. We are as good as there. We are fully, by the way, this is the difference between the, the, the teaching of Jesus and the way of Jesus and the way of religion. We are not trying to accomplish things religiously so that we can achieve salvation or nirvana or enlightenment or heaven. We are as good as there now. We are in Christ and fully experiencing the life of the Spirit. Now all that we do is, is rooted in gratitude. It is a freedom to say, uh, I, I can live my life now with the joy of Jesus because it's all just true, it's been gifted to me. I just have to trust that it is so. In, in order that the coming ages, we, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And then Colossians 3, this is a whirlwind of scripture, but I just, I, I want to overwhelm you with the fact that this is a theme that's baked throughout the entire New Testament. Uh, Colossians 3, 1 to 4, we read this. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. You, there it is again. You have been raised with Christ. Set your, but here's the implications. Then set your hearts on the things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died. And, oh, here's this beautiful phrase. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. How beautiful is that? Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Where is your life? It's hidden with Christ in God. Set your mind on that and then live out of that reality of already being fully alive, fully saved, fully embraced, and in already that intimate relationship with God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I need some volunteers. Um, three or four volunteers will do. And, if, and that's, I can't, uh, regional sites, we can't wait for them. So Oakville, that's on you. Uh, three or four, whoever wants to just come on up. I, uh, there's stairs at both sides, just stand up and start walking up. We've got one person, that is great. <laughs> I only need two or three more. There's a couple over there, that's fantastic. So good. Oh, and there's one more coming, okay, good. Okay, great. That's gonna be our full complement of volunteers. 
While you guys are coming, I left my prop backstage. Hold on, go stand center stage, just a second. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, good, good, good. Here's my prop. Welcome everybody, I'm glad you're here. We've got one more coming, good. Um, let's see, hi, you stand over here. You guys stand over here with me, hello. We volunteered before together. Oh, you've been up here volunteering before. That's great, you guys got a shtick happening. That's really good. This is your annual reunion of volunteerism at the Meeting House. Hi, you guys. Okay, we'll get to you in a second. First of all, we are the Trinity. Ta-da! All right, I'm gonna be the sons. You're the Father, you're the Holy Spirit. Okay, good. Before anything else existed, there was God. But God is love. God is not the single monad who was sitting there in all eternity past saying, I'm bored. I need to create people so I can have a relationship. God forever existed in relationship. Relationship is, 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 is the origin of everything. Relationship comes before anything else exists. And so in communion, let's put our arms around like a huddle there. In communion, this is the basis of everything else in the world. And, and so when God, thank you, when God creates us, he is not discovering, oh, so that's what it's like to love. Oh, that's what it's like to have a relationship with that which is close but yet distinguished from me. God doesn't discover relationship through creation. Out of relationship, he creates, right? Relationship, love, is the beginning of all things. Then God creates us, and, and in creating us, we are spirit beings like God, but he wraps us in flesh. That's what this blanket is, this is flesh. You guys are gonna stand together. You're gonna be like Adam and Eve. This is gonna get awkward. All right. So he, <laughs> he wraps you guys in flesh. <clears throat> Still the same spirit. He blows, I'm gonna just blow a little bit away from you. I'm not sure of my coffee breath, but <laughs> he blows and yes, and now you guys are, but you're wrapped in flesh, beautiful. So the incarnation says that we want them to have the same intimacy that we enjoy with ourselves and with each other. So the son is sent, you guys stay here, the son is sent on behalf of the Father, on behalf of the Spirit, and he incarnates into flesh. Now I'm gonna get under the blanket. This is gonna get cozy. Good. So now, are you feeling loved, my man? This is so, yes. Yes. So he, Jesus comes and takes on flesh with us. And then he doesn't just leave it behind and say, well, that was a fun 30-year experiment. I'm done now. In fact, Jesus forever lives. He's taken on humanity and his scars and his woundedness and yet his eternality. He is the first fruits of what we're all going to experience. That's the whole point is his journey now is not just the God journey, it's the human journey. So Jesus remains in flesh, but now resurrected flesh, now what we're all to experience and his end goal is to bring us all. Come on, come on with me over here so that we can have the fellowship that God was having from the dawn of all time. Bring it in for the love, everybody. That's so nice, that's so nice. Okay, that's it, round of applause for our volunteers. Thank you guys, thank you. That was great, well done. Well done, we'll see you again next year. Yes. <laughs> Now, some of us are visual thinkers, and it's a lot of words, a lot of words, a lot of words, and then we see something, and ding. But here's some more words. The Apostle Peter says, we haven't even gotten to our passage in John yet. This is just the introduction. The Apostle Peter says this, though he has given us, um, though, uh, oh, sorry, through these he has given us, he's talking about the many blessings and grace that God has given us, and then through these he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may, participate in the divine nature. This word participate in Greek is koinonia, have bonded fellowship, have a closeness that is not just a friendliness, but a bonded fellowship, koinonia, that you may participate fully fellowship with or in the divine nature. That we are, are we, do we just become God? No, we don't just get absorbed into God so that we're just all, but we have the intimacy with God that God has been having himself 
for all of creation. He did not create us to exist over there separate from him. He, he created us to have that kind of beautiful, loving intimacy. He wants to share the love. God is love and he wants to share the love and pull us into that intimacy with him. So now with that as the setup, we see what would cause the New Testament church to talk this way, to be so bold? Jesus. Now in John 14, John 14, we'll look at verse 20. He talks about the day, just so you know, in the verses previous, he says, there is coming a day when the Spirit will come to you. And then he says in verse 18, I will be the one who comes to you. Well, is it Jesus or is it the Spirit? And the answer to that is yes. And then verse 20, he says, on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. There's that intimacy, that beautiful, beautiful intimacy. And then in verse 23, Jesus says, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Now he's talking about him and the Father. All right, so who lives in us? Is it Jesus, the Holy Spirit, or the Father? And the answer is yes. Yes, through the Spirit, the fullness of who God is, is in fellowship with us. And then in chapter 15, he talks about the vine and the branches and that rich intimacy that we are, we are part of the full, the full organism as branches in the vine. And then in, in, verse, in chapter 17, verse 20, you know, now in 17, Jesus is no longer teaching his disciples. He is praying to the Father. And I've said this before, it's beautiful how the New Testament takes time, the Gospels take time, not just to have Jesus teaching us about our relationship with God, but it takes time to actually let Jesus model his relationship with the Father. There are passages where he is, um, he is praying to God, and the disciples are able to eavesdrop, learn from, and record his prayers. There are passages where Jesus is teaching about his relationship with the Father. And there are passages where God speaks about his delight in the Son. Uh, there are these beautiful relational moments throughout the Gospels. And, and it makes sense now when you see the whole thing is a revelation of where we're all headed. That, that, that God wants to pull us into that relationship. This is gospel, really good news. And so here Jesus is praying to the Father and he says, my prayer is not only for them alone, that is the 11 disciples that were with him at the time that he's praying for, but I pray for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. That's his prayer. That's what Jesus wants that we would be in Jesus and the Father having the same kind of intimacy that Jesus has with the Father so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And he goes on actually for the next few verses and continues with that kind of rich, intimate union. It's a psychological oneness, it's a relational oneness, like best friends, like spouses, like siblings, like, like twins, like people who are used to being together and are finishing each other's sentences, like a Jedi and his Padawan learner. There, there's this real closeness, but it's even more than that. It's an actual kind of, not, not just an, I'm gonna get philosophical here for a second. It's not just an existential oneness, but it's an ontological oneness. It's, it's a oneness of our, of our essence, of our being really brought together in this relationship. Uh, let, let, let's make it visual. Uh, we could graph it this way. This is, this is how we were made to live. And to some extent, it, we only can take another breath because in some way, in him we live and move and have our being. That's true. But there is a relational way that we have chosen to exit this fellowship with God. And so we, we step out through sin, through walking away from missing the mark, and the mark is love. It is the love that we were birthed out of in the first place when we walk away from that, that's sin. 
And this is not geographical, it's not spatial, it's a relational understanding. We separate ourselves from God. Now religion is offered and has for thousands of years been something that is offered to try and bridge the gap. If it is hoops to jump through, rituals to participate in, texts to memorize, prayers to resuscitate, to resuscitate, to recite, thank you. I'm a paid professional communicator. Uh, <laughs> it, it is, it's stuff to do to finally achieve. And it, it, it never works. And it's a treadmill. And for thousands of years, achieving actual intimacy with the divine has been the goal of our religion. Whether it's called nirvana or enlightenment, heaven. This, this achieving that has been the goal of world religions. And for thousands of years, people have tried different things to do it. But this is what Jesus does. He comes to us. He takes on sin. He takes on our flesh. He who knew no sin becomes sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God. And he takes us back with him in God. The goal of all religion is accomplished by Christ as a gift to us. So that we simply trust that it's true. This is you if you are in Christ, if you trust that it's true, this is you now, as we have read in the text. This is who you are now. May every decision that you make, every feeling that you feel, thought that you have, way that you treat others, live out of this reality, that you are taking God with you into this world. This is such a freeing and joy-filled message. I would want to share it with as many people as possible, but not just be a mouthpiece for it. I want to experience it to meditate on it, and then to allow that to affect my heart, my character, my emotions, my thoughts, everything about me. I've said this before, I'll say it again, this is not our way to life, but our way of life. This is the gospel. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is not our way to life, it's our way of life. We're alive, we're our lives are hidden with Christ and God. Beautiful, that's, that's worth an amen. Amen? amen. amen. Amen, I know you're not Pentecostal because I have to ask you to say amen. <laughs> but I also know that you're not too liturgical because at least you say it. So that's good, thank you. All right, do, do we have any questions? Uh, any questions about, we'll throw it up to Q&A before I share a final thought. A, a, um, any, any question, we've got someone with a microphone who, can come to you. Well, listen, if you do come up with a question, raise your hand, flag her down. I'll see if someone has sent in a text question. Cynthia says, how do we know what Jesus prayed to the Father? Oh, how do we know what Jesus prayed to the Father if the Gospels were written by the apostles? Thank you. Uh, Jesus actually took the apostles with him. If you read, he would say, come with me, wait there, I'm going here, but he would take some of the apostles with him when he would go and pray. Because Jesus was not only relating to the Father, he was discipling his disciples. He was modeling to them uh, his relationship with God saying, so everything was a teaching moment for Jesus. He's having a real relationship with God. He's really praying, but he's also saying, here, come, observe everything. Re observe and learn. Be discipled by me. That's what disciples mean. So he didn't keep things private from them. Not all the disciples were always with him, but he would always bring two or three. Say, come over here and just, okay, now stay there. I'm gonna pray. So um, that is the nature of the discipleship relationship. Great question. Thank you. We got someone. Good. Uh, Bruxy, was this um, what Paul said? Was this new? Uh, was he clarifying what was being taught already? It seems like he had to make it clearer for people or they were getting it wrong. Uh, yes, you're right. The epistles, which are letters written by the Apostle Paul, are letters that are written to churches after they have first heard the gospel, been discipled in the gospel, and then need reminders of the gospel. So when we read the epistles, we, we, we read one half of a conversation. Maybe people have sent him questions and he's writing back to say, here are some answers to your questions. Or he's heard that they are confused about some things. Or he's heard that they are visiting prostitutes or whatever. And so he's writing them to say, let me remind you of the most important things. Why does it take so much reminding? Why does Paul have to keep saying this? Yes, because it is radically new. There's nothing like this ever in the history of religion or philosophy, that everything has already been accomplished for you as a gift by a personal God, simply stop holding your breath and <sighs> welcome this truth in. 
nothing like it. And, and I think it has to be repeated not only because it is unprecedented and unparalleled, because, also because it is so simple that we often are tempted to try and make it more complex and add in a little bit of law, a little bit of religion, a little bit of ritual to somehow kinda, cause that's just too simple, right? And so that is often some, that's been the case when Paul writes to the Galatians. He has to tell them, stop adding to the message. Stop adding, I know it's tempting, but Jesus plus is not the gospel. Jesus period, that's the gospel. So we need to continue to remind ourselves, to remind ourselves of its simplicity, straightforward, this message of grace. And I want, to, I want to pray for us that we would do that. Now, how do we? Here's one thing we can do to partner with God continually reminding us. Um, in, in John 15, when Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches, and he says, you need to remain, branches, hey, branches, you need to remain in the vine. He goes on to, to say what that means. He says, remain in my teaching. If you remain in my teaching, you remain in the vine. So, so we, there's a very concrete, for those of us who are concrete thinkers, we say this is all conceptually really interesting, but what do I do? Here's a practical thing we can do. Jesus is saying, read my teaching, learn my teaching, study my teaching, soak in my teaching, let it get inside you and live it out. That doesn't achieve anything for you. That's your way of expressing what is true. You're wondering how to get spiritually unconstipated? That wasn't in my notes, that just came out. We can edit that later. <laughs> Regional sites will never hear that. Uh, do you wanna, you wanna get spiritually unconstipated? I said it again. Just, it, it, just stop holding, oh, no, this now it's just getting weird. Um, <laughs> as we bring the teachings of Jesus in us, that really then allows us to stop holding back the spirit. Here's what the Apostle John wrote in 2 John 1, 9. He says this, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So one of the ways that we say, yes, yes, I believe, is to say, Jesus, you are valuable enough to me, central enough to me for me to just simply learn your teachings and then delight in that. Because what we've been talking about today are the teachings of Christ. So that's part of it. I'm not saying, and add on to Jesus a bunch of ethical stuff you have to do. I'm saying, learn the teachings of Jesus like we've been doing today, be freed up from that, and then because you are now in Christ, because you have been brought into fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because that is true, because your life is hidden with Christ and God, now you get to joyfully, out of gratitude, have the privilege of letting those teachings affect how you live. It becomes a beautiful, beautiful way of being in this world. So I'm glad you're here. I hope you're gonna come back next week as we dive into more of what, what the Bible says and how we, can, how we can learn these teachings and live these teachings. But in the meantime, I wanna pray that God helps us become a people who are as irreligious as possible, who are not bound by a, 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 a system that we have created for ourselves called the Christian religion, but are freed up by the grace of God to joyfully fellowship. Because you know what? The unity that we have with God is a unity, a fellowship, a oneness that if you heard the root words of Jesus there, are also that we are to have with one another. So we come together both with God and with one another to experience it in joy. Now this is gonna be my prayer for us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of Jesus who takes on our flesh and then leads us home. I thank you for the oneness that you have designed us to experience and have made possible for us to experience through Christ. And I thank you that this is a oneness we can have with you and with one another. It is my prayer that your Holy Spirit would continue to knit us together as a church community across all of our sites. And it is my prayer that we would be a people who, can, who, who are able to continually deepen our experience of joy, of freedom, of delight in this gospel message. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, brothers and sisters. Remember, 
Jesus didn't come to bring us a religion. He came to bring us back to the Father. That doesn't give us freedom to sin. That gives us freedom not to. Don't forget to pray for the children, for our fellow brothers and sisters all around the world, and for those that are still lost in that darkness so that they too could see that light. May our Father bless you. May He keep you. May His grace shine upon you and give you peace. I'll see you next time.